everybody. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good to see you back here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the day that the Lord has made. Anybody going to be rejoiceful and be glad in it? Welcome to the day that the Lord has made. Amen to that. Um, we have a couple of announcements. Number one, um, there is no level of caffeine enough, but um, we're going to find out today's service how much caffeine there is. Uh, number two, there is a 3 p.m. fellowship meal here today, 3 p.m., um, people from Holy Cross were invited. A few other people have been invited. I have no idea how many people are showing up, but we're going to find out. Um, but don't forget, come. There's good food, and there's lots of fun and lots of laughs. Um, any other news or sadness or joys? Yes. Yes, and also, don't forget, next Sunday, um, we will be downstairs in the fellowship hall. Every month that has a fifth Sunday, we will have that fifth Sunday downstairs in the fellowship hall. It'll be a little bit more casual. Um, there'll be coffee and stuff down there to eat, too, during the service. Any other news of joy or concern? Yes. Amen. We will keep her in our prayers. And we'll keep you in our prayers for having to put up with her right now. Well, that, was, that goes without saying. Anything else? Any others? Yes. Amen. They were fantastic. Amen. We would still keep... Everybody in our prayers. Any others? Yes. We'll definitely keep them both in our prayers. Um, how about Charlie? What's an update? Okay. Well, enough about him. How's the bike? <laughs> oh, it's for sale. Apparently, we've learned how the bike is, but it is. It is so. But how's he? But he's doing a little bit better and. We're finding out some answers to what he's going to have to have to go through. Yeah. Amen. We'll keep you in our prayers for putting up with... No, and we'll keep you both in our prayers. Thank you. Same thing, Dorothy, with you and Jim. Uh, any others? Prayers or joy or whatever? Yes. Yes. Ooh. We will definitely keep you in our prayers. Make sure somebody lets us know how, how things happen on Friday. Any others? Yes. What if I don't want to take you off the prayer list? We will leave it right there. As long as we know he's doing better. If you all could just bow your heads, please. God of love and mercy. Ooh. Ooh. I don't think I need that much, Mike. God of love and mercy. 
embolden us to become witnesses who are, who are unafraid to be your disciples, unafraid of the microphone. We think of so many in this church and in, in our lives who have gone before us, braving the difficulties presented by life. We name them in our hearts before you, grateful for their example. We also name in our hearts those people who are ill, who, are, um, who, who, who mourn, who feel lost, who feel alone. You know, help us to be, to those people and others, a, a lighthouse congregation who, by, by our example, comfort those around us. Be with this church that it may be a true witness to Jesus Christ and all that we do. Amen. If you could, everybody, let's get up and let's greet each other in the name of Christ. Let's spread those germs of love and shake hands or elbow bump or high five or just say hi. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. If you could, please rise and join me in the call to worship. Awake and rise up. Get ready to worship and to serve God. Open your hearts to God's will this day. Amen, amen. Please be seated.
Amen. If you could, please stay standing and let's sing hymn number 310, He Lives. You know, that sounded so pretty. Let's not even stop. Pat, let's go ahead and do hymn number 98. To God be the glory. Please join us.
Please bow your heads. Holy and loving God, you treat us not like the stern disciplinarian, but like the forgiving parent who runs to embrace us when, when we've rebelled or disappointed. Your mercy gives us the opportunities to try again to, to return to your grace, to pick ourselves up and brush ourselves off. You forget how many strikes we have against us, but invite us back, back into the inheritance you desire for us. May our offerings today reflect our gratitude. In Christ we pray, as he taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Your legs are tired. While we're sitting, please join us in singing hymn number 714, I Know Whom I Have Believed. Amen, amen. While you're sitting, can you turn to page 8 for me in your hymnal? Page 8. As we have our prayer of confession, please follow along with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We've not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We've not loved our neighbors, and we've not heard the cry of the needy. 
Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So in about 35, 37 minutes, I get to do something very few people get to do. I get to be in two places at once. This is a busy day for this message. Um, today, here, 9.30 as usual. Later on, 11 o'clock. Same theme, different message. But there's also Reverend Ravel, Frankie, Pastor Frankie, had messaged me a week or so ago and asked if I would be generous enough to do a recorded message for Lavelle United Methodist Church. So at their 10.30 service today, I will be doing a similar message. And it's fun for me, because that, that's my home church. And I, I was talking to some friends who still go there, and I was like, I wish I could be there, but I can't, because I have other things that I am doing, namely taking care and, and being here with my family. But... Uh, that's also a very special church to me because that's, that's the church of my calling. And we're going to be talking about that today. So if you could, please turn in your Bibles or your Bible app to Jonah, Jonah 1, 1 through 3. I think it says 1 through 17, maybe in your hymnal, I don't know, in your bulletin, but 1 through 3. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai, Get up and go to the, to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port city of Joppa where he found a, sheep, or found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. You know, let's keep going. I like this one. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that had threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate soldiers shouted to their guys to help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was, he was just sound asleep down in the hole. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused a terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? And Jonah answered, I'm Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Just throw me in the sea, Jonah said and it will calm down again. I know that this terrible storm is my fault. Instead, the soldiers rode even harder to get the ship to land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God, O Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. O Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the soldiers picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. See, the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish, for three days and three nights. And so is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. So as I mentioned, Lavelle was my, my home church. That's where I went for many, many years. And that's where I had, uh, that's where I had my calling. 
And I remember having lunch with Pastor Ravel. And um, I don't know if we, a lot of times we would just, we'd go to Planet Fitness and work out, and then we'd go down to Uncle Jack's pub or some pub. We'd have a beer and a calzone, just undoing that hard work we just put into the gym. This time I remember walking with him to the pub, and I'm going, uh, I'm going, Frankie, I feel myself being called. But totally ignore that, please, because I've got plans. I know what I want to do. See, we're all being called. We all have a calling. We're all the church. We're Christians. Each one of us has been called. And if you look at the Great Commission, it's in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, I think. So you got then at this Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, the, and the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus is telling them, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching, and they're supposed to teach people to obey everything that he commanded to them. And he goes, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. See, we're called. Each one of us has a calling. Every lay person is called to carry out the Great Commission. Let me rephrase that for emphasis because this is an important part. That we think, oh, I'm not being called, I just go to church. Every one of you here listening doesn't matter where you are, whether you're at home, whether you're here, whether you're on a trip to Ohio, sitting in church, sitting at a ball field, sitting at a track meet, going to Walmart. Everybody is, is called to carry that great commission out. You can't run from it. You can't deny it. You can't pass it off. It's your call. God knew what he was doing. He knew who he was calling when he called you. And he expertly and intricately detailed every single aspect of your life. Your being, your persona, your psyche, your physicality, everything about you from, from the texture of your hair or how soft that beautiful bald head of yours was to the color of your eyes to, to the way that you laugh to fingerprint on your thumb. See, everything, everything is connected to your calling. And until you walk into the fullness of the thing that you were created for, you're going to find yourself frustrated. You're called. I'm going to date myself here for a little bit. Does anybody remember you know, like those wall phones that used to hang on the wall at home? And if you wanted to not have to bother with the phone call, you'd have to take the handset off the receiver and and like hang it there, or you have to like leave it dangling there by some cord, because yes, there was a time when phones had cords on them. Well, now there's this great feature on cell phones. It's called Do Not Disturb. Do Not Disturb, yeah, that's great. I love Do Not Disturb. It allows us to keep doing what we want to be doing without being interrupted by annoying phone calls. It allows us to get to the call when we're, when we're good and ready. It puts us in control. It is a great feature for phones. But it is a horrible feature for your spiritual life. And I'm convinced that many Christians today go through their lives with do not disturb on. They want to keep on doing what, what they want to do. They'll get to God when they're good and ready to get to God. See, in our, our text... So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. This idea, this idea, that very simple idea of, of God speaking up shows up seven times in the four chapters in the book of Jonah. That's perhaps one of the most important truths, not only in Jonah, but to each of your very lives. God speaks to people. He is not some impersonal force. God knows, God sees, God involves himself in the world. Sometimes you might feel like he ignores you. 
your prayers, the sin and pain you see and feel. But God knows. God sees. And God acts. Well, where is the word of the Lord in your life? The fact that God speaks means, means two things. God wants people to know Him. God wants to be involved in their lives. And the word of the Lord is to be obeyed. There is nothing more authoritative in the world than the word of the Lord. God spoke every single thing into existence. Spoke everything into existence. Spoke his words to his people through the prophets. Sent Jesus Christ who's called the word. And God left us with his word. But what place does the word of the Lord have in your life? Are you truly, truly open to God's call? See, God calls his people to those who are not his people. God calls to invite and involve us. And it's important to point this out because we don't think sometimes that God could possibly call people to those who don't even know him yet. And I believe people in the church today don't think God would call them to those who did not yet know God. And imagine Jonah at this point. God's already used him to prophesy to his own people, to give them the good news, to, to preach to the choir sort of thing. Now God's asked him to give God's message outside of his normal boundaries. It's almost going to seem as though Jonah never even considered the possibility of taking God's word out of his comfort zone. See, to be like Jonah would be to limit where God would send you. Jonah was okay where it was comfortable. He was okay sitting on his couch, watching the service on TV. He was okay coming Sunday as long as he didn't have to do anything Monday. But he ran. He ran when it required more. Where are the limits you've placed on God's will for your life? The places you won't go. The things you won't do. The people you won't talk to. The stuff you won't give up. To limit, to limit what God might do with your life is for God to not actually have your life. At all, every part of it needs to be on the table. See, because sometimes God's call is as much to us as it is for us. And if you take the whole picture of Jonah, all four chapters, what we see in the verses is that God is calling Jonah for a task. But what we'll see at the end is that God was, was really calling Jonah to himself. What Jonah saw is a call that he believed would be harmful was actually very helpful to him. See, God didn't need Jonah. He could have sent his word to Nineveh from the sky, but he chose to invite and involve Jonah so, so he could change Jonah. And could it be that whatever it is that God is calling you to do, that it could be as much for you as it is for those to whom So there's an authority, an authority to the call. But the authority of the call, it's, it's, not, it's not in the cost or the lack thereof of the call. The authority of the call is in the one who called. I was looking at my plans, and then God, you know, he, he stood up and said, I got plans. And I was talking to my faith mentors, and there was one, one of my Sunday school teachers, Cindy Morrill, and I said, I need you to pray for me. And she goes, pray for what? What am I praying for? I said, I need you to pray for discernment, that I'm hearing God's word and not my voice. I said, I'm, I'm feeling I'm being called, but I want to know. And she goes, mm, you're going to have to figure out because eventually you're going to learn that if God is calling you, you don't have a choice. It's going to happen. He's the one with the authority. If God is asking you to do something, simply do it. You're always safer risking everything for what God has called you to do. 
then you are attempting to control everything for the hopes of safety or security. Risk with God is always safer than running from God. If God has called you to sell everything and move your family to, to Iran or, or Afghanistan to share the gospel, you're ultimately safer there than you are running away from him anywhere else. Launching Jonah and his people and being really unfriendly. Oh, I don't want to go there. They want to kill me. You're safer running there than you are running away from him anywhere else. It's better to risk your job, that relationship, the money, your children. See, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that the church in America is way too safe. We don't know what it's like to risk for Jesus. The greatest let's try out let's try out a new small group. Let, let's try out a, a let's try a new hymn. Or oh, here's the hard one. Let's try a new brand of coffee. For our budget, our building, just give it away, people. Our leaders, our children, our plans. What if there were a bold, committed, sold-out group of Christians who made Jesus first in every single thing that they do and every part of their lives? What could they not accomplish? And I long to be that committed. And I know many people are going to go, but pastor, God never asked me to do that. He's never asked me. Well, have you ever asked? Have you ever offered everything to God? Maybe God has never called you to risk these things because he already knows what's in your heart. Think about the risk that Jesus took coming to earth. He left heaven knowing the cost, and he still went through with it. What cost is too great for you to do what God is calling you to do? What are you not willing to give up so that people who don't know Jesus and are ravaged by sin can be saved? See, there is no, there is no greater cost to your spiritual life than when you attempt to stay safe and apart from God. Jonah, the great prophet, national hero, super religious guy, he hears from God, and he runs. God called him to arise and go, and Jonah rose and left and fled. The exact opposite. It's really crazy how Jonah heard God, dropped the mic, and ran off. There are so many people that will, that will give an amen to a sermon, but they will not amend their life. And we need to understand that just because you hear from God does not mean you're automatically obeying God. That great commission again. Jonah here has demonstrated what I believe many in the church today are suffering from when they hear from God. They sit under preaching. They read their devotional they check off their Bible reading plan, but when it actually comes to changing their lives, they drop the mic and they walk away. And I know it's the case, because in many, in many, many churches, the people of God, they do not look particularly different from the rest of the world. So either they're not hearing the word of the Lord, or they're not obeying the, Lord, the word of the Lord. So there are lots of reasons why we run from God. But honestly, if you want to be really blunt about it, if you want to dumb it down as much as possible, if we're running from God, it's ultimately from a lack of faith. Because it shows that we believe God is not able to provide for us, or not able to protect us in what He's called us to do. See, we run from God when when we feel inadequate. Imagine God has asked you to go to, to Iran or, or China or some place that we're not particularly welcome and tell the, tell the people of that country that God is not happy with them and he'll soon judge them. 
imagine, imagine if we got up and we went over to Allegheny territory and we told the Allegheny people, God's not happy with you. And he's soon going to judge you. Are you up for the task? You ready to go? You got a bag packed? See, the original language that, that hint, the original language of the scripture hints that what God is calling Jonah to do was not simply, let me run over there, over that foreign country, and let me just say a couple words, I'm going to run right back. No. This was not a parachute in and swim out type of mission. Jonah would need to stay there for a little bit. He'd need to unpack. He'd need to be comfortable. He'd need to find a place to live and find a grocery store and, and, and declare God's word. See, if, if God is omnipotent, if he can do whatever he wants, if he can do anything, then it is always the case that whatever I believe I cannot do is based on my perceived limitation and not any actual limitation of God. Some people, maybe they run from God because they feel prideful or privileged. And sadly, we find out in Jonah that this was one of the cases for Jonah. He didn't think the Ninevites deserved God's mercy. He believed his race, his country, his church cornered the market on God. He believed he deserved God's grace while they didn't. Well, the same grace that saves you is the same grace which saves the worst terrorist the worst mass murderer, the worst person in the world. We run from God sometimes when we, when we fear the cost. See, following God may cost you your perfect life, your perfect dreams, your prosperity, your plans, your desires, what makes you happy. However, running from Him will cost you far more. If God has called you to do something, He will supply you for it. Sometimes we run from God because we, we're thinking we're running from His presence. And I start going, what a horrible idea to think that, that we're going to try to run from God's presence. You cannot be in a good relationship with God and try to run from His presence. You can't be in a good relationship with God and decide to not do what he says. Tarshish has stated three times to underscore that Jonah is not following God's call. God said, I want you to go 500 miles that way. So he decides, I'm going 2,000 that way. The son of Amittai. Not that, that name of his. It literally means son of my faithfulness. See, even on the run... Jonah was marked by God's faithfulness. And that faithfulness will catch up with Jonah and will ultimately save Jonah. Something there for us, too. Because if you're a Christ follower, then you're marked by God's faithfulness through Jesus. God wants to and will catch you and will save you. You just got to stop running. Maybe you're here in church. Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're, you're listening to this later on on Sunday. Maybe. Maybe you're running from God in a different way. Maybe you've never given yourself completely to Him. Maybe you have the do not disturb on, and, and you'll get to this Jesus thing when you're good and ready. You see, God is calling. But are you positioning yourself to hear from God? Do you really want to hear from God or do you have limits? Will you or are you running from his call right now? And I want to leave you with this, this little story that I heard. And I don't know who originally told this story. It's been told to me so many times and I've read it so many times that I don't know who to give credit to, but I'm going to tell you a story because I love stories. And this was one time, like 1929, and Georgia Tech was playing the University of California in the Rose Bowl. And there's his player, and he recovers a fumble. But in the scrum to recover the fumble, 
He gets bashed around, he gets turned around, he gets twisted around, and he starts running. The problem was he's running the wrong direction. It took one of his players running after him as much as fast as he could to tackle him right before he crossed the goal line to score points for the other team. And as all the players went into the locker room at halftime, and they were sitting down, they were wondering what the coach would say. And then this young man that ran, ran the wrong way, he sat by himself and put a towel over his head, and he cried like a baby. And then when the team was ready to go back on the field for the second half, the coach stunned everybody. And he said, the same players who started the first half, you're going to start the second. And all the players left the dressing room except for that one. The young man, he wouldn't budge. The, and the coach looked over at him and called him again, and he saw his cheeks, and they were just wet with a strong man's tears coming down. And his coach said, or he said to his coach, I can't do it, coach. I've ruined and disgraced the University of California. I've ruined myself. I couldn't face that crowd in the stadium again. Shoulder. And he said, Roy, get up. Go back. Game's only half over. When I read that story, deep inside I said, what a coach. God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances because you see, the game's not over yet. Amen. If you could, please rise. Seven thirty three, marching to Zion. Seven thirty three.
So this all started January 1st. And I can't remember the last time I did a sermon series this long. I'm sure there'll be others. January 1st was, how are we responding to Christ? The gift of Christ. How are we responding to that beautiful gift? And we responded. We spent a few weeks talking about necessary sins. Those things that we think we have to have in order to get through life. Grumbling, complaining, biting, devouring each other. Telling falsehoods. Unjust anger and gossip. And then that led us to the idea that pride, pride is something that separates us from our relationship with God through Christ. Because we start demanding our own way. We start demanding that we can't worship God if I don't have my favorite music played. We can't worship God if, we, if the temperature isn't right. Sean, people are telling me, right next to you, I'm too hot. Jane's telling me he's too cold. Tim's telling me it's, it's too bright in here. They're not, but you get the picture. So there's that consumer Christianity where it's not about God, it's about us. And then we read about the, the new mindset, the new devotion, needing to be devoted to the right things. And what are those things that we practice in order to devote ourselves to the right things? That's radical hospitality, extravagant generosity, risk-taking missions and service, intentional faith development, passionate worship. And we talked about passionate worship on Palm Sunday, on Easter Sunday, and we talked about having a, a genuine, passionate connection with, with God. And then today we talked about how so often we're running from God, and I wonder if people are running from God because... We're afraid of what happens when we get alone with God. Because there's something about being alone with God that will show you something about God, but more about yourself. There's something about being, being alone with God that will hold up a mirror in your life and show you all of your faults, all of your shortcomings, and maybe, maybe we just don't want to deal with it. Maybe we don't want to deal with our issues, our failures, our pain, our brokenness. Well, I've got to tell you, if you feel alone, you can know Jesus as your friend. If you're battling anxiety, you can know Jesus as your peace. If you're financially uneasy, you can know him as your provider. If you're sick, he's your healer. If you messed up and if you sinned and if you've fallen short and, and if you're broken and if you don't and, and if you hurt people and, and done things you're ashamed of, you can know Jesus as your Savior. So go forth with the idea in your heart, game ain't over yet. Run to God. He wants to heal us through transparency and authenticity. He wants to heal us when we go to him. Amen. God bless.